presentation we can get going. Um, thank you all for coming along on the um, for the last session. We hope there'll be you can all stay until the end and you don't have to rush off to trains or anything. So this is your this is the test of whether it and um, there's a full screen thing down here. Okay. Which we'll be talking about beyond ecosystem services, valuing the invaluable. So. Thank you. Um, so, in the next few minutes, I'm going to take you through a quick um, appreciation of ecosystem services, uh, a couple of quick problems that we might have with it, and a proposed solution. So, I'm going to look at uh, the problem of beneficiaries, problem of definitions. What is the ecosystem valuing framework which we're suggesting can help enlarge the approach towards nature conservation? How we might implement it? And then briefly a footnote about an alternative approach. So ecosystem services, as I'm sure you know, um, is widely adopted. It is very good as an approach for conservation, we argue. It takes a consequentialist approach. So it says this is what will happen if we protect these places or systems. This is what will happen if we don't. You'll be sorry if you don't. So it's very pragmatic and it's useful for talking to a wide range of stakeholders. As such, it can complement traditional, more intrinsic value type approaches. And it can help us to identify people's complex mm -hmm. motives. Sometimes the reasons we want to protect a place may not be obvious until someone asks us a whole set of, set of questions. And those questions might go along a whole set of different types of ecosystem services. Do you love this place because of what it gives you in terms of provisioning of food and so on? Do you love it because of its beauty? 
all sorts of issues can come out. And so you can build up a fairly sophisticated kind of evaluation with lots of different metrics together. And consequentially, you can connect it to the economy and marketize this and put money on it all. But that's where some of the critique begins. So the two problems I'm going to outline are a sense, uh, in a sense, the first one is a problem of justice on equity. The second one is a problem of logic. So the justice one, beneficiaries, oh, before we get there, just to point out ecosystem service, I did a quick search for titles of articles, only titles that include ecosystem service or services on Scopus. 2016 ones are not all in yet, but you can see that the upward trend is continuing, and we probably have more than two articles per day with that in their title. So it is a massive um, area, as I'm sure you all know. So the issue of beneficiaries. Um, services definitely suggest that there are people who are served, but in order to talk about ecosystem services, you don't have to say who is being served. And this, we suggest, is one of where some of the problems begin, because uh, you can have different parties who have different interests in a place. Maybe that something like carbon sequestration is a simple enough one. After all, CO2 diffuses all around the globe in a fairly equal kind of way. Um, and uh, issues like sea level rise or climate change can threaten a whole number of people's livelihoods. But even there, you can see some people have more to lose than others. And if you come to something more connected with conservation of species, perhaps, like, do you care that there are two species of African elephants? Why should we protect both of them? Then it becomes much more uh, dependent on who you are, and your experience, your place in the economy, in the world. So that's one issue. Then, as I say, is a kind of logical problem, because it seems that none of the simple definitions of ecosystem services really work. Um, these three columns represent three uh, kinds of definitions that have been offered and often used. So some people say ecosystem services are ecological processes that we appreciate or value or whatever. Some people say it's the outputs of ecosystems. Some people say it is the human benefits. And each of these seems to have something to contribute. But when we look at a whole set, just an example of ecosystem services commonly referred to in the rows of this table, we find that none of the basic categories really captures all of them. So Ecological processes captures quite a lot, but it doesn't seem to capture recreational opportunity, spiritual experience, whatever. Animal welfare is sometimes considered an ecosystem service. So you might have to move across and try another one. Ecosystem outputs doesn't do much better. Maybe human benefits, but then we seem to have lost some of the earlier ones in the list, which are not directly benefits. Pollination, okay, it leads to benefits, but then invasive species get pollinated, and that doesn't lead to benefits always. And then the final three rows just point out there are some other things which are not generally considered ecosystem services, which would be captured by most of these definitions. So insect reproduction, is that an ecosystem service? Well, why not? Um, oxygen release is a fascinating one, which seems to have changed its fortunes in the last few years. Talk to me later if you're interested in that one. Uh, profit from rising timber prices, well, that's a human benefit. So if you try and make up a definition, it doesn't seem to catch everything. It either catches too much or not enough. So this is where we might briefly think about the main categories of ecosystem services popularized by the MEA. Um, and more problems are multiplied here. But I want to suggest that if we look at both supporting and cultural services, in a sense, each of these could give the inspiration for a framework that catches everything. And the one I'm going to talk about mostly today is cultural. And I'll come back as a footnote to talk about how you can use supporting services to catch everything as well. So. What the question we want to ask in our ecosystem valuing approach is how do people value this place? And you'll see we catch the beneficiaries issue here because we start with people and we're going to have to say which people. So we take an approach which is based on a, a philosophical framework called aspectual theory which suggests that there's a number of fundamentally different ways that people experience the world. And somehow these are supposed to be comprehensive and capture the full range of human experience um, in a set of axes that are um, not reducible to each other. So hopefully that will become clear as I just rush through them. So if we start with, um, say, these three that we've called ecological aspects of a place, how do people appreciate a place ecologically? We might look at how they appreciate it physically. That might capture a lot of the regulating services stuff. Biotically, that might capture some of the provisioning services um, in terms of foods and water supplies. But then let's also think about the sensory experience of a place, which humans, but probably other animals, have as well. We value places for their effects on our mood and comfort. Does it give you hay fever? Does it relax you? And so on. Then there's a, cat a set of categories of aspects that we might call cognitive. Um, and these are a bit different from what normally comes in the ecosystem services approach. 
But if you say, how do we analyse a place and how do we appreciate it for the things we can distinguish in this place, then you've got the very idea of diversity, biodiversity or vegetation diversity, whatever, as something that people seem to appreciate cognitively without having to say that it's a, a kind of service. Historically, we love places sometimes for their history and what they've been, um, what's been invested in them over the course of uh, human or ecological time. Uh, and symbolically, places refer to things. They have symbolic meaning to us. They have connotations. Then we have a set that we might call community, communal um, aspects of how we appreciate a place. So socially, we appreciate a place for what happens in it, what can happen in it socially, for the spaces it provides, um, for uh, appreciation and what's appropriate. Economically, we need to think about that, not just in monetary terms, but in terms of how we relativise the value of places. How do people choose one place over another, for example? Uh, is, the, is the value sustained over time? Questions like that. Aesthetic speaks for itself, I think. Um, we say that is a distinct uh, aspect of appreciation. It can't be reduced to any of the others. Finally, what we call ideological um, aspects. Uh, again, these are not normally captured in ecosystem services approaches, but they seem to be fundamentally part of our experience of the world and how we appreciate places. So what's sometimes called dural is simply about duty to others, what we owe to others in the world, or to future generations, or to other species. That can be a high motive for some people. That can be high up in why we want to protect a place, because we sense that we owe something to people. It's not a service to us. It's more like we want to serve others. Altruistic takes that further the simple love of a place where we really want to give ourselves, give our time, give our money to protect a place. That seems to be, there's been a discussion in the literature about services to ecosystems rather than ecosystem services. But it's bound up with how we appreciate a place. And the final one is, has an ugly name, but certitudinal basically refers to issues of conviction and identity and how we are committed, perhaps non-rationally, to a place. We might, it might have associations for us because we grew up there, for example or there might be religious or spiritual issues in that category. So that's a, a set of 12 axes that we suggest could help us to make, um, uh, take an approach to valuing natural places uh, and make it more inclusive. So if we just focus in and think about particular people, beneficiaries, who are concerned or experts in particular aspects of valuation, we might have a whole set here, think of the physical aspect of, of managing the land. Um, indeed, not just humans, but all kinds of animals appreciate the resources that sustain life, then healthcare providers, for example, are interested in the sensory benefits of a place. Scientists, classically, we distinguish, we count, and so we're interested in diversity, my diversity, as scientists. The historical aspect might be something that educators are particularly sensitive to and have views on. Journalists, perhaps, for symbolic. Local people, obviously, always need to be remembered, and their social functions. Economically, then, business needs to be factored in. Aesthetically, we may need to talk to people who have particular mm -hmm. cultural interests. And then policymakers, obviously concerned with justice. The voluntary sector, massive, is concerned with loving a place, going beyond justice. Uh, and then we might talk to all sorts of people, campaigners or, or religious leaders or all sorts of different people for that uh, aspect of commitment and certainty. So just to show this is not all um, uh, qualitative and vague, um, there would be various ways that you could start putting numbers on some of these things for actually implementing it. And this is just a table that I don't have time to run through. But there could be all sorts of ways that you can measure human appreciation of places in different aspects, always remembering to start with particular people and not just being vague about the beneficiaries. And, and there are increasing levels of normativity involved in these, so a whole lot of work needs to be done to develop them. I said I would do a footnote about um, the alternative approach as we see it, because supporting services gives us the idea of what we call ecological effect assessments. So ecological processes, which many of us probably study or have studied, um, like pollination, herbivory, predation, mm. nutrient cycling, photosynthesis, these are ecological processes that we know and love. Um, but if we want to factor these into a conservation <coughs> ethic, then of course we have to trace them downstream. How do they lead to benefits for particular people in particular ways? And so this can be an alternative approach, which can also potentially capture just about everything. But we suggest that conflating the two, the human perspective and the ecological starting point, into a single category like ecosystem services um, is not helping us to be clear um, and, and account for disservices and, and problems as well as benefits, for example. 
Um, this presentation can be found um, at that tinyurl.com ecosystem valuing. Um, and uh, just want to thank a couple of charities that funded the work and listen to any thoughts or suggestions or questions you have. Thank you. So I suppose the key thing is that we don't add them all up. If, if you take a, a monetization approach, of course, then at some point you have to add them all up. You have to put money on them all, add them all up, here's the answer. And, and we think there's a fundamental injustice in taking that approach because you immediate, as soon as you do that, you marginalize certain stakeholders, you, marginal, you, you potentially overlook certain aspects of valuation. So basically our answer is you don't. Um, you don't do anything to summarize them. And you get them all the way to the policymaker or the whoever is interested maintaining diverse uh, views and then that's the political and ethical challenge that policymakers are faced with how do we balance the competing views of these people so we're suggesting it's not the scientist's job to find a way of adding them all up um, hi yeah, can i just um it's interesting because um in other sessions we've talked about scientific evidence leading to policy and um, also informing in policy practice, and um, a lot of policymakers and practitioners say, well, they want a sound business case, and, and everybody seems to be increasingly moving towards na discussions involving natural capital, people like Natural England, um, and um, I've heard people propose, and I would probably support, the need to be quite flexible in moving and using different language depending who you're working with. Um, and I just um, you seem to be, it seems to be quite a purist kind of approach. Um, so, so would you not advocate using the term natural capital or, um, and you see scientists as being separate? Yes, we, we generally, we, we initially called it Beyond Ecosystem Services and Natural Capital, and we took that bit out because we hadn't said so much there, and indeed we're not quite so critical of that perhaps. Um, it's, it's less tangible, it's less subject to trading and marketization and so on. Um, but yes, we, we do think... Um, Basically, I mean, I, I leave this footnote in as the, the ecological modelling approach, which can go so far, and you can posit uh, economic scenarios, of course. Um, but we want to suggest that shouldn't have the last word. It shouldn't be the default approach, I suppose. Yeah, thanks. Richard, thanks. Great talk. Um, you said it's not scientists' job <coughs> to add it up. Is it anybody's job? And if it's nobody's job, then, then you're... Aren't you just stuck with apples and pears, which is where we started off with? Thank you, yes. Well, I say that's policymakers. That, that's, the f that's the perennial problem that policymakers face. We have different interest groups. We have different business cases. Um, and, yes, yeah, somebody has to look at the winners and the losers. But we're particularly inspired by the political ecology um, discipline, sub-discipline, and, and the interest there in how we, how we look at the winners and the losers from any, um, any action. So... Yes, in a sense, we're not trying to take us too far down the line, but we're suggesting that we should at least get some useful categories at the start um, and then feed those through, I suppose. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. You'll have to move on, so thank Richard again. Okay, thank you. I'm slightly scared now to follow on from Richard um, because I'm thinking that some stuff maybe needs to be framed a bit differently for, for my work. So um, I've, I've done quite a different piece of work. I hope you can see these. Um, I'm in, in a research programme at the University of Zurich and our research programme works on a number of globally distribu distributed sites, as you can see here. Um, it doesn't work on here, excuse me. Um, so we have sites from Siberia in the far northeast of Russia right down to our Dabaraton in the Seychelles. 
And these are very different um, ecosystems. Um, and the program that I work in is mostly looking at ecosystem functioning. So they're doing lots of measurements on kind of biotic interactions, vegetation, plant growth, phenology, um, trying to look at ecosystem functioning and the impacts of global change. How, and, and most of our sites, I should point out as well, are largely in protected areas. So they don't have big human populations in them, but um, and they, they're obviously kind of in their research sites because of where they are. <coughs> um, but of course there are people who live on or near those sites and there are people who are beneficiaries for those sites. So um, th there are quite big differences between the sites. For example, we had Lake Zurich in Switzerland, which has a huge population of the city of Zurich around it. Whereas in, in the northeast of Siberia on the Tibetan Plateau, we have very small rural communities that, that are slightly dependent on the sites. But what we don't have within our research program is very much work actually on those populations of people. Um, it's very much a biophysical research program. And so one question that was asked was, well, what are the ecosystem services that are delivered by our site? So this is kind of a backwards question for, for many people, I think, in this room, because we <coughs> didn't start with beneficiaries, we started with sites. And so my PhD was to start to look at are, do we have beneficiaries and who are they? And, and actually, when I, when I started to think about this, it was problematic because they're, they're protected areas. So, of course, we didn't have very many um, or very big populations, but we also didn't have very much knowledge about this within the programme. And so I had to start to think about who are the beneficiaries. Um, and here we have a few examples of the groups that I kind of started to think of as stakeholders. Now, the, the obvious one was, was ourselves as international researchers making, uh, taking quite a lot of use from these research sites. But, of course, we also worked with our own local researchers. So we already have a bit of a question here around, OK, when we talk about researchers, are we local, are we international? How are we actually embedded within the research site that we work at? But then, of course, once you go to the site, you also have the local staff that we have to work with anyway, but they're dependent on those sites for their employment. And they're usually, um, or they're very often, local people as well. So we have a couple of different categories of people here. And also because most of the sites, but not all of them, are um, uh, protected areas, we, so they have um, a number of tourists and visitors who go to them as well. So my question then for myself was, OK, who, who do I access and how do I access them? Bearing in mind that I had eight very different globally distributed sites to work on. And so... Finally, I chose to work with our own researchers because, of course, they're very accessible to me. And then the local researchers who are at those sites that we have collaborations and, and relationships with. And also then the local staff who were working at those sites. Now, by local staff, I generally mean site managers, site rangers, and uh, research assistants who worked within the research groups. Um, and, of course, there's some crossover between these groups. Some of these people are local, some of them are really not local, and they don't know the site at all myself for example and then within these groups I, I tried to just differentiate and get some information from them about their age and how they were connected to the site and how much experience they had with that so I have a few metrics about the people that I worked with and then so I kind of thought about populations and people and who's there bearing in mind the populations are not very high for most of the sites and then the question was, well, OK, what about ecosystem services? And now this is a very basic level, so I guess I need to apologise to Richard for this. So I'm really looking at provisioning, regulating and cultural services as, as defined in the CICES framework. It's being used fairly, fairly consistently across quite a lot of different research programmes, so it made sense for me to use this as my framework for talking about ecosystem services. And I did a very simple qualitative set of interviews with people asking them, well, do you think that this area delivers this service at all, according to you? So it's a very simple kind of initially presence, absence uh, set of questions for people. And I recorded people's answers for each of the questions. I adapted the questions slightly because, of course, with most but not all of our researchers, I could just use the CICES framework because that was understandable to them. <coughs> but when I then moved to speak more to non-researchers or some of the local staff, not all of them, the ecosystem services terminology wasn't really accessible, so I tried to adapt the questions to capture some of those services. And so my first piece of looking at the data was simply to say, okay, according to those interviews, 
which, how many of these services in these categories are present. So it's really just a presence-absence uh, analysis, it's not even an analysis really, of the sites. And really you can see, what's quite interesting for me is that the cultural services across the interviews, basically there's 11 cultural <coughs> services in that, in that CITES category, all of those services are, are agreed to be present at that site. So I think that already raises some questions that I need to ask about this category. What's interesting is provisioning shows the most difference. So Kitalik, this is the, this is the site in Siberia, which has uh, almost no population who, who live there. Um, and this site is a Chinese, is the Tibetan Plateau, um, which has, quite a, it has an agricultural community who live there. But I also spoke to a lot of um, researchers. So we see there are some differences. Um, and I'm also not entirely sure about the regulating services of conceptualising what you mean by the regulating services is actually quite difficult in an interview and that was apparent from when I spoke to people and I think that's <coughs> partly what I'm seeing here. So I can see there's some differences. I can see that cultural services are kind of just blanket across the board, yes, they're present. So um, I then tried to break it down a little bit and say, okay, is there a difference between <coughs> your local and your not local? Now, I don't have a high number of interviews for some of the sites because access to people is quite difficult. Um, so the numbers at the bottom here, if you can see them, are the, are the numbers of interviews that I've done. And I've just tried to divide that between local researchers, uh, sorry, local and non-local people. And there, is, there are some differences here in provisioning. This is for provisioning services. So, for example, on the Siberia site, I had researchers saying, yeah, they, they use uh, peat to build houses, and uh, we, there's genetic material that's collected for research, and, and none of these were highlighted by, by the... Uh, local people I spoke to, so that was quite interesting that possibly what people perceive as either provisioning or important is there's a difference there. Um, and also <laughs> for Aldabra Atoll, well, there's a kind of a research community li that live on that atoll, and the people who live there quite for quite a long period of time are, are slightly dependent on a small, very small garden that they have to grow vegetables. And, and actually, they were the only ones that really mentioned tortoise poo for compost, for example. And actually, someone mentioned dead animals for decoration. So, so I had some interesting differences in here. Um, and also, uh, Paso is a forest in Malaysia. And a couple of local villagers talked to me about the surrounding area that had ag aquaculture in it and the importance of water to that. And I didn't pick that up in the same way from the researchers, uh, from the non-local people. Um, and again, with, with regulating, you see that there are some huge differences. Again, the Siberia site like quite interesting because most of our people that are working there who are not local, so the international researchers, they're working on uh, methane and carbon exchange in the tundra. So, of course, for them, regulating services are super high, but, but that's not necessarily on the radar of local people. Um, yeah, and interestingly, at one of the tropical forests, um, the researchers didn't mention um, erosion control or kind of air quality, which was quite interesting for me that that didn't come out. So there's some things that I'm seeing here, but this is really the presence absence, um, yes, no, it exists. But that obviously I've got these interviews that have quite a lot of text in them, and I want to unpick that, and I've started to look at that, and one of the reasons to unpick it is, do I find some sort of consistency in indicators of different services? Can I see that from the interviews that I've done? Um, and I am particularly interested in cultural services because I think, as I've done it at the moment, this does not unpick cultural services and how people value places um, as I have it at the moment. And I'm really interested to see if I can pick out from the interviews language that helps me see how people value the places where they live. So. Um, I've started to look at some of this. I'm sorry if this text is a bit small, I think. So I can pick out things like biodiversity indicators. So other forests are degraded. We have species and diversity. People mention specific plants and animals that they use. Um, <coughs> these, are, these are on two different sites, but they, they're still mentioned. So there's some consistency here. This, is, um, this, this sentence is from Siberia again. I can also pick out some language around... Um, how they use them. So it's not just that it's biodiversity, but it's actually, is it used for food? Are they hunted? Um, are they fishing? Are they hunting? So these activities, which obviously carry cultural connotation with them. Um, I was also then interested in, OK, are there values indicators in here? And I think this might be quite rich for me to look through. Um, what was quite interesting, we've got a scientist, a foreigner founded the area, and they seem quite proud about that, whereas we have poaching talked about on a lot of sites. Now, of course, that's illegal activity, but that has a value attached to it. And if you're prepared to be in, engaged in that activity, that clearly has a, a value within it as well. 
and then value something as a hobby or the whole area is protected so this discussion of whether a protected area is valuable to people or not but within all of this also is a bigger issue for me of looking at scale because each of the research sites is very different and it has very different populations and if you think about somewhere like Aldabra Atoll in the Seychelles nobody can really live there but the, the cultural importance it has for the Seychelles is quite big and the research importance it has is quite big and actually the scale of where you think that that value goes is much bigger than just Aldabra or the Seychelles it's kind of a global importance so the other thing I'd be really interested to look at is the scale of thought that people have about these services so are they talking about the area which might just be around the edges of the site, so the research station, really specific research area. Sorry, and then are they talking about the area, so it might be the protected area or the reserve, so it's a kind of political boundary here. Is it an administrative district, a council, um, a region that has its own designations? So we're really into political boundaries with this. Um, or is it a countrywide, this is really important for the rest of China. Or does it go beyond this? We're we talking about our American scientists, our foreigners, and also the importance of international research. Um, so this is the beginning of this research, and I'm going to do some quantitative analysis on the, on the text, but I realise that even from a small amount of interviews, I don't I have about 60 interviews, I have, a lot of, I have a lot of rich data that I can dig into in there to really help us with indicators for ecosystem services, or maybe I need to frame this conversation slightly differently, but can we pick out from how people who live and work in an area, can we pick out from their indicators that give us more than just presence, absence in, uh, information, and can it give us scale information as well? And um, I also want to look at how do these perceptions differ depending on various factors, so demographic factors, such as your age or your connection to the site or, or your kind of um, how long you've known it as well. Um, and I'm just beginning to realise at this stage of my research how important this kind of quantitative work is for helping us with looking at uh, indicators for ecosystem services. Um, and with that, I need to thank a number of organisations that have helped me, um, that have allowed me access into their sites and to talk to the people who work for them. It's not always easy in some of the areas we work in. And also uh, my colleagues at the University of Zurich who've been a uh, good support. So thank you. Any time for maybe one, one or two questions? I'll just change the presentation over as well. Sure. Really good presentation. Have you looked at the value literature? Are you using like a value typology to get at the different values that you want to look at, particularly the social? Yeah, I haven't values. looked in depth at the moment, <coughs> but I'm starting to look at some of the work on relational values, for example, and I need to use that to help me categorise what I need to look at with the values work. But yes, it's the it's really recent um, ecosystem services special issue on. Um, values at the moment, mm -hmm. transcendental values yeah. and that sort of value. Is there one more quick question? Um, I was interested to know whether, because you, you said you asked some of the questions with an ecosystem service base and some of them where you mm -hmm. translated it. Do you think, do you have any sense of whether you were getting a different type I of answer? I think so. I think, I mean, anyone who works with social research will know this area. I think if you, in any case, if you do interviews with people, it change, you change as you do the interviews. So <coughs> by the end of it, you're much more comfortable with what you're working with. So that already was different. Um, and yes, I think I have got some slightly different responses from those interviews, and I, and I need to try and look at that, I think. But I know there's also inevitably some bias in there because some of them I could do in English, so I could do them myself, but we have had to translate <coughs> some. So of course, there's also a slight issue with translation, and I, need to, I, I will need to bear that in mind as I'm looking at what I have. Thanks. Okay, Thank another. Thank you for Catherine. Um, this next speaker is going to talk about unpacking ecosystem service bundles, and she will tell you more about it. Thank you. That's a nice clicky thing. Cool. Hi, everyone. I'm Bex. I'm from the University of Southampton, doing a postdoc there. And today, I'm going to talk about a really widely used methodology to um, identify, understand, explain, or predict ecosystem service <coughs> bundles. So ecosystem service analysts widely recognise that ecosystem services do not vary independently of each other. They tend to co-vary over space or time. The current understanding of how multiple services associate across heterogeneous landscapes is currently poor. 
Um, but this understanding is essential for management of multifunctional landscapes, for avoiding costly uh, trade-offs and identifying or enhancing synergies. So whilst many analysts have um, said that ecosystem service associations are highly context-specific, some authors, such as Elena Bennett in 2009, has, made a, has called for general rules um, for associations between ecosystem services. Um, and this made it is thought that cross-study comparisons of different regions looking at the associations between services um, can facilitate the search for general rules. But um, search, doing cross-study comparisons is quite difficult due to the wide um, range of methodologies that are available. So this study in 2010 in PNAS by um, authors at, in Canada um, just came up with the spatially explicit ecosystem service bundle approach um, based on cluster analysis. Um, and this is to identify areas, oh sorry, so what are ecosystem service bundles? They are consistent sets of ecosystem services that repeat over space or time and they're typically um, identified using cluster analysis um, where different regions on a map provide different sets of types and magnitude of different services and um, they're usually typically presented with the use of these flower, gram, for flower diagrams which show different services and their different magnitudes. So. Um, in that paper, they made a call for the, for the um, cross-study comparisons, and it's since been applied in many regions over the world in the last two years, so in North America, Europe mostly, um, in China, Sweden, Denmark, South Africa, and Fr French Alps, for example. And so I'm going to, I looked at these studies that use this ecosystem service bundled approach and condensed um, the steps into four steps that kind of capture the plurality of all the methods used. So the first step is the aggregation and harmonisation of multiple ecosystem service data from all different sources. Um, the identification of these e ecosystem service bundles, which is typically based on correlation, principal components analysis or cluster analysis. Understanding the ecosystem service associations by identifying their social ecological determinants of the co-variation between services. And the assessment of whether bundles are associated with different social ecological systems. Um, so I'm going to go through these four steps with an, and demonstrate them with application to a French Alps case study. So the French Alps are a socially and ecologically relatively large region, um, dominated by forests and semi-natural land. So you get in typical of mountainous regions, you get these high, densely populated urban areas with intensive agriculture in the valleys and more isolated rural and semi-natural areas. So we set out to identify and understand ecosystem service bundles using the current state-of-the-art approach of ecosystem service bundles. And we wanted to assess this utility of cross-study comparisons. Does doing a cross-study comparison um, shed light on these general rules of ecosystem service associations? So we split the, north, um, the French Alps into the north and the south, which actually corresponded to an administrative divide at the NUTS 2 level, and um, they're quite socially and ecologically different. Um, they're generally referred to as the North and South Alps. So step one. So we selected nine ecosystem <coughs> services that have been mapped previously by Emily Cruzat and authors in the French Alps. Um, these were ecosystem services that were deemed socially, economically and ecologically relevant to the area after collaboration with stakeholders and local managers. So these included three provisioning, three regulating and three cultural ecosystem services. We did the analysis at the municipality level, which is what is widely used in these ecosystem bundle studies. Um, so about 1,500 in the north and 800 in the south. And these data sets were very diverse in the metrics used, so we standardised them to a common dimensional units by um, transferring them to uh, z-scores. So looking at the relationships, so when we look at relationships between services, spatial relationships, it's typically done by their spatial overlap, where a spatial overlap signifies a synergy and a lack of spatial overlap represents what's called a trade-off. And then we um, and then, the, then what is done after that is um, sorry, so to do that we do correlation analysis or principal component analysis when we have multiple um, ecosystem services we're looking at. And then the ecosystem service bundles are identified using cluster analysis, where clustering algorithms such as k-means, self-organising maps, or hierarchical clustering methods are used to define these groups of ecosystem service, so to delineate areas that deliver the same types of magnitude of ecosystem services that can then be um, visualised using these flower diagrams. And the results of the clustering analysis are made spatially explicit when the classification of each spatial unit is projected onto a map. So we can see here is a region that corresponds to bundle four. 
Um, so we did this in the, the North and South Alps separately, so because we wanted to look at the utility of a cross-study comparison. So um, broadly speaking, well, we use k-means clustering analysis following in PCA. Um, so broadly speaking, we found um, similar results and diff quite different results across the North and South. So in the North, um, these are the relative provision of the different services and their z-scores. So uh, values close to zero represent like average values across the entire region, um, whereas the positive values. Um, represent um, high delivery of that particular service. So in the north and the south, we had these bundles that were characterised by the high provision of crop production and low um, delivery of all other services because they're trading off. Um, in the, we also had um, bundles represented by re by the forest-related ecosystem services like timber production and carbon storage, and a lack of crop production. Um, and the third bundle in the north and the south was um, a bit more difficult to interpret. Um, kind of intermediate value <coughs> services, but um, high erosion, carbon stock, and hunting in the south, for example. Um, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not too interested in going through the details of that today. It's about the methodological approach. So step three is the identification of social ecological determinants of the ecosystem bundles. So to, to understand the spatial distribution of the associations between ecosystem <coughs> services, we need to understand and identify the drivers and their interactions that produce these coherent sets of ecosystem services across landscapes. So this is done in typically qualitatively or quantitatively in these studies that I've identified. Qualitative interpretation um, generally involves linking these maps of the bundles with the underlying land use in the areas, um, whereas quantitative approaches have also been used. These include multivariate analyses. Um, these analyses tend to come from community ecology, where a site time species matrix is analyzed in relation to a site times environmental variable matrix, but the species matrix is, is a ser ecosystem service matrix instead. Um, but also, um, ra uh, in the literature, I found random forests and multinomial logistic regressions have been used, where the response variable is the ecosystem service bundle itself. Um, so that's quite interesting. Um, but all approaches, no matter what you use, you need to identify relevant candidate social ecological variables. And this is typically done by consultation with the literature or experts, so what drives individual services and their co-variation with others. So these include land use, land cover, bioclimatic variables, slope, elevation, population density, stuff like that, widely available data. So we did this in the French Alps using a redundancy analysis, which is a multivariate analysis that looks at what variables are significantly driving, social ecological variables, significantly driving the co-variation between ecosystem services. <coughs> and the main result was that it was quite different across the north and the south. So in the north, we had a very tight relate. So the arrows, the difference between the arrows and the redundancy um, analysis is a visual representation of the relationships between the services and the drivers. So in the north, we had quite a tight relationship, for example, between carbon storage and timber production with forest area. So this is a, um, these are forest related services that are not surprisingly tightly associated with forest cover. <coughs> but in the south, we didn't find this. So, we, so forest cover is not related to timber production and carbon storage, which I'll explain in a minute. And then as the fourth step, which isn't so distinct from the third step, um, uh, some authors have assessed whether these ecosystem service bundles are associated with different social ecological system classifications. So a study by, two studies actually by Mikey Human in South Africa, um, looked at the service bundle distributions and looked at their overlaps with um, these different delineations of social ecological systems using different variables. So they looked at an these anthrome, so the anthrome approach, which um, clusters variables such as population density and land use. Um, and with well-being bundles, they looked at various um, indicators of well-being, such as income, education, and see if they see, saw if they overlap. And the answer was that they didn't really. So, um, from the case study um, and using this approach, I don't think any fine understanding of ecological processes and interactions was gained. The degree to which different social ecological variables can explain the distribution bundles varied across the north and the south. And land use land cover, which is widely used in ecosystem service bundles of both individual services and of bundles, um, was not related. It was, was not a good predictor. And this is, was largely due because management has been abandoned in the south of forests since the war for conservation reasons. So limitations to this cur current approach and the future for the research of ecosystem service associations. So the overall approach of, of um, inferring interactions between services based on their spatial co-location this isn't, um, so we, we know that causation doesn't equal, no, correlation doesn't equal causality, and causation doesn't also, the flip side, relate to co uh, resulting correlation. Um, we're just looking at the overlay within the same unit, pixel, or municipality. 
Um, we cannot really understand the mechanism. Is it, are things trading off just because of competition for land use? Is there a direct effect? For example, a lot of the PCAs in these studies show that timber production trades off with um, agricultural production. Like, it's not particularly interesting. Um, and we've known that for about 2,000 years. Um, and the ecosystem services do not actually have to co-locate with each other to be related. For example, um, the negative effects of agriculture on stream quality can be felt downstream, which may not be within the same pixel. So there are various statistical issues with the, pro with, um, the approach. Cluster analysis in is inherently exploratory. It's not generalizable to other regions, and it's affected by the ecosystem service algorithm and the number of clusters. And they have an error, it's dangerous using these clusters because these maps have an error of authority and they're being used to communicate to stakeholders. Um, selection of ES, um, this, this ES that are bundled in cluster analysis are mixed, they're <coughs> realised potential. There's these mix of ecosystem functions and um, vary in their degree of the social compartment. So mixing them is really difficult to um, do because they're being predicted in these multinomial regressions. So it's like, what are we predicting? It's just a complete mess. So no mechanistic <laughs> understanding. So we need to actually take a very hypothetical approach. What is the hypothesis we're testing? Do we have the data? If we don't have the data to look at a fine understanding, don't do it. Um, selection of drivers. Um, yep. Um, spatial to scale, that's a really big issue. Things, as I said, in the same pixel. Sorry, I'll stop. No, 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 sorry. Oh, okay. So, so you've, got time. you've got time. Oh, I had time. Oh, sorry. So within the same... Um, <laughs> 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 sorry. Um, not so much for me. Why not? Oh, okay. Okay, so um, we know, so by mapping the same ecosystem services, all ecosystem services, and their drivers within the same spatial unit, whether it's a pixel or a municipality, um, doesn't really make any sense. We know that different processes have different scales. They all operate at different scales. Carbon storage is determined by very local factors, the soil type, vegetation. Water quality is affected by factors varying at the landscape scale or at the catchment scale, the forest cover, and then the landscape, its configuration. Biodiversity is, again has landscape scale drivers and very local drivers. So no mechanism is understood by shoving everything into the same unit, but it's due to data availability. And I think because all, all European member states uh, EU member states have to map ecosystem services, so that's a problem. It's the, it's the race to map services as opposed to think about the mechanism. Um, boundaries are completely, the studies that use manip municipalities as spatial units, the boundaries are totally arbitrary for most ecosystem services, and management is rarely at this level. So the argument that it's a good spatial unit to use in studies, as ma made in the original paper, um, eight different services are managed at different scales, so farm scale for agriculture, um, forest block. Um, yes, so that's a summary. Have I got time to go? Yeah. Okay, cool. That or a question? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, thank you for listening. These are all the co authors. <coughs> I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
where sustainability is frequently characterised in terms of the maintenance, restoration, substitutability and depletion of natural capital. Here, the securing of accessible, equitable and consistent supplies of ecosystem services is considered a prerequisite for human prosperity. Yet, the human-centric presentation of ecosystem services, which Richard was talking about earlier on, is often criticised for being reductionist and not fully emphasising and acknowledging the holistic social-ecological complexities of human nature relationships. And in this talk, I want to explore the idea that landscape, at both a functional and conceptual level, acts as a cross-cutting theme to ground e ecosystem frameworks, anchoring their abstractness into a comprehensible form and rendering them more susceptible to decision-making pro processes, improving both their practical and policy relevance, as well as their ability to accommodate complex social cultural processes. So in short, the principal point I want to make is that landscape affords a much stronger and tangible social ecological scaffold upon which credible ecosystem service frameworks can be de delivered. So why is this? What is it that is particularly special about landscapes. So the original Germanic conception of landscape echoed a social physical expression of the connections between humans and nature, but contemporary notions describe landscape as a complex multi-dimensional construct. And here, landscape pattern, processes and meanings are considered to result from collective historical, social, economic and environmental structuring, presenting a dynamic and fluid vision as such, landscapes represent the tangible and visceral ways humans identify with, experience and understand the broader environment. So landscapes are determined by the complex interrelations between the visual, audio, territorial and the spatial, as well as our personal history and memory. We experience landscapes in phenomenological terms, where our lived experiences and the ritualistic embodied practices that combine to create a sort of dialectic between landscape and life. And in this way, what we experience as landscape is facilitated and co-produced through our performative acts. So ultimately, landscapes are not simply out there, but they are both externally and internally experienced. And landscapes feed our minds and imagination. Evidence from environmental psychology, for example, suggests that when individuals and communities engage with each other through landscapes, multiple benefits arise, such as improvements in social learning, the promotion of social capital and, and enhanced mental and physical health, but also that social interactions between humans uh, have generally been shown to have an overall positive cognitive effect on our emotional states and stress. Also important is that identity, meaning and scale are intimately connected to the landscape setting, uh, evident in concepts such as the local, the global and place. And although place and landscape are connected, the boundaries between them being porous, they are not the same. Landscape pr uh, presents a broader and richer tapestry of meaning and inclusivity in which considerations of place are subsumed. So realised in this way, landscape is not simply a terrestrial interpretation of the environment, but instead refers to the space in which humans interact, affect and perceive, and is therefore equally applicable to the coastal and uh, marine environments humans have made their home. So associated with the normative construction of landscape is the idea that judgments lie at the heart of how landscapes are fashioned, hence issues of social justice are hardwired into the fabric of landscapes. So landscape can be a tool of domination, instruments that partake in, reproduce and exacerbate social struggles through their spatial configurations and the moral authority they legitimate. So dynamism, power and agency drive the production of landscapes and play a fundamental role as processes that mediate interactions within landscapes. So in this sense, the, the formal and informal institutions uh, they, which play in society in the ways that they shape uh, individual and collective agency, especially through power-laden political processes, exerts their influence on the landscapes we inhabit. So landscapes are symbolic of directed, purposeful human exploitation and colonisation whether the result of land clearance for human settlements, land conversion for production or mining for natural resources. The fortunes of many cities, <coughs> nations and empires are extricably linked to how those societies have pursued the plunder of natural capital in order to manage the pressing issues of land and natural resource scarcity. 
and the widespread and intensive resource exploitation promoted by production and consumption, stimulated by demographic shifts, international <coughs> trade and globalisation, has resulted in a widespread changes in the structure and function of many terrestrial and marine ecosystems, but also in an era of increasing food, energy and water insecurity, inequalities in natural resource use and scarcity also produce significant social impacts, particularly on poorer, marginalised communities, often causing dispossession, impoverishment, social inequities and further erosion of gender and ethnic relations. But of course, landscapes are not simply uh, the preserve of Western culture. Notions of human nature relationships mediated through landscapes are deeply ingrained in the cultural heritage and development of human societies around the world. So, for example, in Eastern traditions like Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, Hinduism, these relations provide a framework and foundation for the elaboration of core belief systems, traditions that weave together strands of the physical, ecological, geographical, economic, cultural, cognitive and metaphysical. So from time immemorial, the sacred and the spiritual have expressed the tangible and intangible connections between humans, culture and landscape. And often these have been expressed in terms of arts, uh, sculpture, painting, literature, music and so on. So in many ways, these richly varied spiritual articulations connect directly uh, to the field of historical cultural landscapes, for example, that underpin UNESCO's World Heritage Sites, but also contemporary pol political and philosophical uh, movements such as deep ecology, social ecology, and spiritual theology. So landscape, then, as a dynamic, fluidic construct uh, arising from social, cultural, economic, political, and biogeophysical processes that operate iteratively across spatial and temporal scales. Landscape acknowledges human influences and connections in the creation of the external environment and construction of form, a creative process that feeds back into human culture and society, contributing to both individual and collective meaning, identity, and well-being. So landscape really ought to be viewed as an active fluidic space, contingent upon factors and pressures of change that may act both antagonistically and synergistically within a potential range of positive and negative outcomes. So landscape is essentially a quintessentially social ecological phenomenon that manifests the properties and qualities of a complex system. But it's not simply an expression of the co-production and co-engineering of humans in nature. More than this, landscape is both internally and externally the embodiment of home, the reflection of our moral and ethical beliefs and values, and ultimately an articulation of humanity's inseparable connection to the richness of our own ancestry and biosphere. And so landscape approaches have increased recently as modes of tackling environmental conservation issues have become increasingly inadequate and their gradual evolution has converged on a more nuanced appraisal of the old conservation development dichotomy, reconciling these often uh, juxtaposed um, opposites through interventions in different components of landscape. So as you can see from the diagram, the landscape approach captures ecosystem services and human well-being within a multi-scaled and multi-dimensional social ecological framing, with landscape situated at the centre, where it interacts with and is co-produced by four main factors, human well-being, governance, social ecological factors and ecosystem services. So what is the implication then for uh, a landscaping of ecosystem services? And I'll just enumerate on five examples. So firstly, uh, multifunctionality and connectivity. Landscaping ecosystem services explicitly recognises the wealth of social, cultural, economic and environmental benefits deriving from landscapes, alongside the connections multifunctionality has with the protection and creation of landscape spaces and the promotion of biogeophysical processes. With regards to communication, understanding and enrichment, landscape expresses a more spatially constructed, uh, planning orientated, more contextualised and human centred approach a unifying concept which is less remote than, and esoteric than ecosystem or ecosystem services, and a bridging concept that links science, policy and people through improving its communicative and knowledge sharing capacity. In terms of reconnecting ecosystem services, the reimagining of the standard ecosystem service model affords a better route to integrate notions of place, connectedness, physical and mental health, social relations and social practice, continuity and identity as is starting to happen in holistic social valuation approaches and cultural ecosystem service <coughs> developments. But also a landscape perspective is relevant to provisioning and regulating services through the lens of multifunctionality, 
and managing interventions across different geographical and scales and contexts. In relation to environmental and social justice, landscaping ecosystem services refocuses the classical utilitarian framing of ecosystem service paradigm away from solely focusing on distributive concerns to also recognising procedural and recognition justice elements. Because landscapes are partly socially engineered and conceived, we recognise ecosystem services as co-produced and thereby automatically acknowledge the wider social and political events and value articulating discourses from which they originate. And finally, in relation to planning and management, the integration of a planning ethos into the standard ecosystem service model may provide a more suitable avenue to connect individual and societal demands in a way that takes account of legitimised social values and decision-making processes. So landscape planning provides a participatory approach to achieve community-focused <coughs> and collaborative government governance, creating the possibility of more place-specific planning and implementation strategies. So, to the final slide. I have argued that landscaping ecosystem services provides a more effective and robust concept better equipped to tackle the considerable challenges associated with environmental conservation and sustainability. Why? Because landscape explicitly recognises a whole host of processes that are either absent, excluded or only partially considered by the current framing of ecosystem services. So my position has been that the connectedness and meanings humans imbue and attach to landscape affords a common language capable of bridging and enriching science, policy and stakeholder narratives, which together provide a more coherent framework for articulating the ecosystem service paradigm. So ultimately, human beings are meaning makers. Without meaning and identity, we lose attachment and our values ever away. And I hope I have convinced you that landscape provides the missing meaning for ecosystem services. Thank you. I think I've bamboozled everyone there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think the problem with landscape is that our memories are so short. Um, I mean, frankly, um, you know, I, I value. I grew up in the Fens, and I value big, flat, open landscapes. Mm -hmm. And that's because what I grew, that's what I grew up in. If I was a time traveller from the 16th century, I'd look at the Fens now and think they were completely trashed. So, basically, all we're valuing is what we can remember in our own lifetimes. I think that's true. There is a, a historical memory of the people currently living, but then you do have books, you do have music, you do have art, which goes back beyond the lifetime of a single individual. And it's not that um, landscape just provides a, a means of valuating, valuing the here and now simply about uh, through what we find currently important. It's, it's trying to take that more holistic, long-term perspective and perhaps looking back historically, but also thinking forwards of where we want to be What's our current condition? Is it good or bad, or is it average, or whatever? But where do we want to go? And I think providing a, a vertical <coughs> that's far more uh, holistic in terms of the way it appreciates the environment around you is a better way of, of getting there than I think we currently have. We might have to change over. Yeah. Um, while I'm doing it, you can keep talking. Okay. If somebody else has another quick question. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering um, whether you've looked at uh, how landscape translates into other languages and what the discourse around landscape would be in non-English <coughs> languages and whether it still does the sort of service that we want to um, do with it. I actually haven't, Richard, but I think that's a, that's a really good um, area. I think in terms of ecosystem services, it's a very sort of westernised concept of uh, the environment. I think we do need to reach out much more to other non-Western traditions to uh, faith groups and, and to get their understanding, their more, much more richer cultural knowledge uh, and try and imbue that into our, our framing of ecosystem services because in very many ways it is sort of foisted on other areas of the world where their conceptions of nature are much more perhaps uh, integral than our sort of atomization for example, the way we divvy up services and so on. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm going to sort of talk about my research uh, on on soils, termites, and ecosystem services uh, out in Ethiopia. 
So my research, I'm basically a small cog in a much bigger machine. Um, so sort of my research contributes towards the Esper Alter project, which is seeking ways to <coughs> alleviate rural poverty, uh, with a particular focus on Uganda and Ethiopia, and uh, sort of yeah, key focus on, on the soil carbon, the soil derived ecosystem services in particular. Um, so yeah. Um, Land and soil degradation, so, sort of background to this the project is land and soil degradation is a, is a really major issue uh, in e Ethiopia. So, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, there's sort of poor, poor land management practices, uh, overgrazing, uh, climatic uh, unpredictability, uh, as they're subject to, to fairly frequent droughts, um, growing population. As uh, ninety percent of the of the, of the economy of Ethiopia, which is rapidly growing, is eco is agriculture based, and a large portion of the population still depends on subsistence farming. So basically, they need more and more soil uh, in production. But this is kind of some of the erosion that's that's happening. More and more soil is going out of production, and because the, some of the soil there is quite fragile anyway, it's it's extra prone to getting overstressed, and then when the rains come. Um, it just gets washed washed away and you just get this, this bedrock. So my particular focus is, is research focus is looking at the effect of termites on, on soil recovery and rehabilitation. And uh, termites are well known for being ecosystem engineers and, and keystone species in some parts of the world, particularly out in this part of Africa. Um, so they have a kind of wide range of effects on the biological, chemical, physical properties of soils. Um, the literature uh, is kind of paints a, quite a varied picture in their effects, depending on land use at the site and pre-existing soil parameters. But their mounds tend to sort of concentrate nitrogen, uh, organic carbon, lots of different minerals and exchangeable cations like calcium and, and magnesium. And um, they also, their feeding activities, they increase soil infiltration rates away from their mine, mounds, soil macro porosity as, as well. And uh, bacterial, level, bacterial levels are higher in the mound soils, often higher than the surrounding soils. And, and the key sort of thing with these termites and some of the main ones I'm looking at are these big macrotermies mounds which you may well have seen on travels or in nature documentaries and these termites are kind of like the big boys of the termite world sort of on multiple levels they're big termites they build these big mounds and they have this big effect on the whole ecology of where they're found and they have this symbiotic relationship with this Tomitomyces fungus and the termites use they grow this fungus and feed on it for their fix of nitrogen and in doing that they sort of feed this fungus uh, a lot of <laughs> plant matter um, and this kind of particularly in arid areas where decomposition rates may, may otherwise be quite low these mounds become hubs of nutrient cycling and, and decomposition um, and this has sort of wide scale effects on on the uh, on the surrounding ecosystem so you get you tend to get concentrations of nutrients in the mounds and then declining nutrients as you go further away so you get this mosaic effect of ecological heterogeneity. So even at the landscape level, this becomes really important. These mounds uh, are sort of biodiversity hotspots, and they have important human implications as well. So this donkey here is feeding directly on the mound soil, and that's because of the mineral con content in, in those soils. Uh, in other parts of Africa, uh, they use the mounds are used in, in, in farming, uh, that the crops crops are growing on, on the mounds. In other areas, uh, livestock graze on the mounds, uh, preferentially. Uh, people will break up the mound material and use it as an organic amendment uh, for growing crops. So these termites have a major beneficial role uh, on soils and on agriculture, while at the same time also being major pests uh, of agriculture uh, and housing uh, as well. So. I've had some kind of logistical issues with, with uh, PhD fieldwork in Ethiopia, I'll get into in a bit. So I didn't have any data, so I sort of looked at other people's data and analyzed that to sort of keep me busy. 
and so this data here, this is this is basically all any studies uh, giving me information on, on land use type and termite community structure across Africa. So it's 27 studies and 111 sites uh, in total. So, and the, this is a successional gradient, I guess you could say, or a land use intensification sort of decreasing gradient going this way. So this is cropland, uh, pasture, savanna, woodland, plantation, and, and rainforest. And this plantation tends to be rainforest converted. And the, this is functional feeding group classifications here. And that's sort of good to get a handle on what the termites are eating in, in the landscape, but it also gives you information on their kind of functional ecological role in the landscape as well. So F1 termites are kind of your lower, your lower termites that are pre predominantly dry wood feeding termites, and some of those are major pest species. Uh, F2 is a sort of generalist feeders, so plant litter, uh, wood, sort of anything going really, they'll feed on. These guys again are, they're the same, they're also generalist polyphagous feeders, but they differentiate from these guys in that they grow fungus. Um, and that's important because that fungus farming has particular sort of effects on, on soils uh, and ecosystem functioning. These two groups here are, are soil feeders. Um, these are humic, sort of freshly decayed soil feeders, and these are sort of true, uh, true soil feeders. And as you see, as, you, as sort of successional gradient increases, um, well firstly in cropland, in disturbed areas, uh, the macro tomitinae, which are these fungus feeders that build these big mounds, but they're also smaller termites as well, they're, they're the functionally dominant uh, group of termites. And some of those are their major, their major pests as well. They're probably the most important economically, agriculturally important pest group. So they attack crops, they attack housing. But at the same time, they also have really important effects on the soil. Uh, even the same species can be, can be both a major pest and a major contributor to the, the soil properties, uh, beneficial soil properties. So, yeah, as you come across this way, um, you can see the soil feeders here, they become more, more functionally dominant. And for the soil feeding termites are entirely sort of a benign species, there's no known pest species, they sort of do their own thing and have beneficial effects on, on soils, but they're very sort of, I mean, they're good disturbance indicators um, because they sort of they have they energ energetically constrained by their soil diet compared to like high sort of plant matter diets, um, so they um, they can't spread very easily and they're very sensitive to changes in, in environment. So yeah, just quickly, if you plot this data on a PCA, you kind of see like if you plot a, a comparison, if you plot data on an eco use it eco zone instead of land use type, you don't really get this clustering to the same degree. But you can clearly see these three different sort of major feeding group classifications are uh, appearing. So yeah, this is my, my study site in Ethiopia, uh, was my study areas in south southwest Ethiopia. Um, so yeah, I've had some kind of major logistical issues in terms of sample acquisition, so I'm still, although I'm in quite an advanced stage of my PhD, I'm still waiting on getting some soil back from there, which a few days ago I heard might have been shipped yesterday, which is really good news, because it means I might have a PhD at the end of this, <laughs> uh, but it's still very much a work in progress. So yeah, just some hypotheses that I'm sort of working with is like I'm expecting sort of termite diversity and abundance will increase. Uh, so I'm, my, a key part of my study is, is looking at this, as I, as I mentioned, this, this soil recovery. So I'm looking at different land use zones like cropland and rangeland, but have different study areas um, of where soil's been put, as put aside, land's been put aside in exclosure zones and the soil's been allowed to come back of varying ages. So seven years old, uh, 11, 14, 17, 22. So there's kind of a chrono sequence of soil rehabilitation. Uh, there is some research on termite, the use of termites in soil recovery and ecosystem functioning restoration in other parts of the world, but none for Africa, so this is entirely novel uh, for Africa and termite, a lot of the past termite research is quite biased towards West Africa, so there's not been much termite research uh, in East Africa. So yeah, so far, I just to quickly go through, I've done belt transect uh, sampling for termites in these different <coughs> zones, I've done baiting with uh, maize cobs and also loo rolls. Loo rolls are a great uh, baiting uh, 
thing to use because you can kind of get them anywhere in the world. They're like a standardized kind of weight and size. Um, and because they're pure cellulose, not, not much else apart from town just wants to eat them. <laughs> so, and this is kind of a, a key part of my, my sampling is um, using transex going sort of logarithmically placed away from mounds and I'm taking soil cores and I'm looking at sort of biological, chemical, physical properties of the soils. I don't really have time to go into, but I'm kind of linking that also to the spatial layout of the mounds in these different sites as these exclosure zones age. So uh, my aim is to kind of link the mounds in the landscape and their effect on, on soil properties on, on all levels. And yeah, just to give an example of how ubiquitous the mounds are in the landscape, each one of these uh, is a mound. And this is just Google Maps data, so you can really see. And you can see also like sampling. So this is obviously a Google Maps satellite image taken at different times. And you can see like the, the, the mounds are kind of a lot more obvious in the dry season. But in the wet season, when the land under cultivation, uh, because of the land being ploughed and, and the crops are growing on it, you can see how much harder it is to actually see the mounds. And, that's true even when you're in the field trying to sample um, as well. So, yeah, some of the data, spatial data that I've got in so far. Um, this is showing sort of the total uh, mound volume in cubic metres um, with increasing age from restoration. So this is like unrestored cropland, rangeland areas. Um, and as you, as you sort of go through, um, you can see like, there's, well, the, the variation is huge. This site is a bit sort of a, an outlier in a sense in that it's, it's spatially further away than these three sites. And unlike these three sites where the soil, certain management practices have come in like eucalyptus and certain trees have been planted and the land's been managed, in this area the land's just been left for nature to reclaim and plants to reclaim on their own accord. Um, so, and you get these really, really unusually huge mounds there. Um, whereas here, you can see like, as the land, as the sort of soil and land gets older, the variation really sort of comes, comes down. You start to see this kind of balancing out. Um, and yeah, sort of number of mounds, uh, even after a decade, you're sort of, you're, you're already beginning to stabilize there um, quite, quite quickly. And yeah, just to give an idea of scale, like these are some, the size of some of these mounds in this latter area. So these are huge. I mean, some mounds have been carbon dated at 3,000 years old, and each colony will maybe survive 20 years, and you'll get new termites kind of moving in, so they kind of will re-inhabit these structures. So it's likely these structures are very old. They could be centuries old, and were sort of have been there for a very long time. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, I've got chemical analyses and biological analyses on the soils that I wish to perform when the soils get here. And yeah, I'm hoping to link that together and use some mixed effects models uh, to sort of yeah, get a good overview of what's going on there. And uh, yeah, just like to thank my funders, Alter and uh, uh, James Hutton, and yeah, my supervisor, long suffering supervisors, and uh, yeah, my assistant in the field of Temis again, it was a great help to me. Thank you. move on, but I'll change okay. over presentation. If someone has a really quick question, then you can chat while I'm doing this. Can right. Sure. Yeah, so I've got some, so, so some social scientists as part of our team, and they interviewed the, the, the local people out there. So the termites are viewed very negatively, uh, in that they do, they attack the crops, particularly during times of drought, and they attack the housing. Like the housing has about a 10, 15 year lifespan there before you need to build a new one. Um, but the mounds themselves, they, they have a much sort of higher, they know that their livestock use them for minerals and they'll break up the mounds and put them on the fields and stuff. So yeah, overall really negative. But obviously they don't, they don't know sort of the, the bigger picture of what's going on. Okay, thank you very much, Ian. Thank and you. We'll welcome um, Emma McKinley to talk about some questions. Everybody. Um, I am going to take you a little bit closer to home um, and talk to you about um, salt marshes, their uses of services and the consideration of those within um, governance and policy really. So it's mainly, it, it's, it's much more about policy and the resilience of um, ooh, services. Um, so we are a, a multi-partner project, um, it's an all Wales project um, 
funded by the National Resources Network um, of Wales, um, and it's very interdisciplinary, and I'll explain that in just a second. The overall aims of Brazil Coast are to look at the function of salt marshes in supporting coastal ecosystem resilience um, and, and kind of understanding how that resilience changes in the face of climate change and various impacts of climate change that we're going to see in the future. So there are a couple of very strong natural sciences and um, pieces of work that are being done by Bangor and Swansea and they're looking at the patterns of resilience and regime shift changes that have happened over the last 100, 150 years and they've been done by looking at aerial photography, maps, stories, literature that you guys are talking about, that, that's being brought in, and also doing some um, lab and field-based studies looking at the impact of biodiversity, vegetation changes, community and grazing. I'm looking at this third point at the bottom, I'm based at Cardiff, and I'm looking at the social sciences, the ecosystem services valuations, and how all of those things are kind of brought together in the governance and policy um, aspect of managing these types of coastal fringe ecosystems. So as I mentioned, the study is an all whale study, tasks one to three, so the natural sciences stuff is actually being done across the UK um, in some aspects, so mapping those regi regime shifts and those historical changes, we're looking at case sites across the UK. My work is looking at um, three case study sites in northwest Wales, so the Glaslyn, the Maudach and the Dovey estuaries. So my three kind of main areas of focus. And the reason why these areas have been chosen is because they are areas of known flood risk. They are already experiencing impact associated with increased storm surge frequency, <coughs> um, coastal erosion, erosion to the salt marshes. So we're already seeing evidence of that. So why are we focusing on the coast, particularly in Wales? And obviously, I'm sure a lot of you have heard this statistic that 50% of our, our global populations live within coastal areas. And in Wales, that's a little bit higher. Coastal area is really heavily populated in Wales. It's about 60%. But it's also incredibly important for direct and indirect employment and for recreation. And it's, it's a really important resource for, um, for that area. Obviously, as we have all many coastal areas, we're starting to see these impacts of climate change, sea level rise, etc. And, and this is um, very, uh, you know, a real significant issue for Wales, as you will remember the storms of 2013, 2014. The previous picture was beautiful Aberystwyth in the summer. This is Aberystwyth during that storm period, and that's the recovery after the storm kind of season happened. So there are a significant proportion, over 350,000 houses are already at risk of significant flooding um, in Wales, and we have significant erosion happening already. So we're interested in looking at how we can uh, examine resilience and, and how that's being represented within governance and policy and things like the shoreline management plans. So we're focusing on salt marshes because we know they're a really dynamic system. So they erode, but they accrete as well. And so are they actually quite <coughs> resilient? So can we look at them as compensatory habitat? Can we look at them as um, managed realignment plans to sit, sort of support that resilience and, and protect those coastal areas in a little bit more effectiveness? But we don't know about how the, you know, about how the ecosystem services will change with regime shifts. We don't know what factors influence that resilience. And that's the kind of work we're doing now. So there's, there's the assumption that all these various ecosystem services that salt marshes provide, so flood protection, um, um, you know, biodiversity and habitat provision, um, pr protection against coastal erosion, recreational values, and um, carbon sequestration is obviously a key one. Obviously the, the assumption is that with changes and decrease in the stability of the ecosystem itself, those ecosystem services functionality and the resilience of those ecosystem services will also decrease. But again, we don't know that. We don't know what the trade-offs are. Um, and how those are, are kind of represented and how they'll be realised in following regi regime shifts. So one of the things that Jordi, my um, kind of counterpart in Bangor, is looking at is looking at how those, you know, where the, the thresholds are and how things will change in changes of, of regime and, and as a result of greater tidal inundation and um, reduction in the actual area of the salt marsh, how is that impacting their capacity to support things like coast protection or... Um, prevention of soil. Um, I'm losing my word there. Lost my word. Never mind. Um, but um, yeah. So do, do, does does regime shift influence resilience in, in the way we expect it to, and how is it impacting ecosystem services? From my perspective, the policy and governance implications are really key because at the moment most of our policies kind of take this um, hard and line view that even with these regime shifts, the line will stay the same. So the coast layer will stay the same. It doesn't have the flexibility. But they don't currently have the flexibility to think okay, if we have this event of storms or this event of coastal erosion, that that boundary within the salt marshes will change and how's that going to impact the ecosystem services that that area provides. And what we're trying to look at is trying to get an understanding of, of where there needs to be greater flexibility in the governance that we have already. So in order to do that, the first step has been to identify what's already there. 
So there was a really large desk-based study to look at the range of, of governance instruments, of directives from an EU level right down to the kind of local, um, more local development plan kind of scales. So looking at shoreline management plans, looking at the ecosystem services provision within these governance instruments, and that included statutory on, and non-statutory, obviously EU legislation, um, looked at particular sectors, looked at whether they were voluntary or not, and also how things have changed over time to try and get an idea of where trends are happening and, and, and what's really been in place in recent years. And this is tiny on these screens, I'm really sorry. Um, but really, just to give you an idea, it was quite a high level analysis, and we were trying to look at which categories of ecosystem services were most covered by the various governance instruments and whether these were statutory and non statutory. So, for example, cultural ecosystem services were most governed by, um, in general, by, by the governance instruments that we looked at, that we identified for those, these particular case study site areas. Um, but, and recreation was the most frequently mentioned ecosystem service in the governance instruments that we are identifying. I need to go into this in a little bit more detail and try to understand more about the context and exactly what kind of levels of consideration <coughs> this was quite, as I said, quite a, almost like a presence and absence kind of idea. So it needs to be looked at in a bit more detail. Um, other things that we looked at was a level of the, the, the geographical scale of the provision of, of governance and, and management, I suppose. So we looked at whether or not the directives were at EU level, whether they were local, national, etc. Regulating and provisioning services had more governance from a European scale, so that's obviously quite important now thinking about what happens as we move through the negotiations around Brexit, which in Wales is being called the EU transition. <laughs> it's not Brexit, it's the EU transition. Um, and then finally, as we would have expected, as the field of ecosystem services continue to grow, there's been a significant increase in the number of governance instruments that cover ecosystem services, particularly since 2010. There was a real boom, um, and that's most likely obviously linked to things like the NEA and the UK NEA. But it's just to have an idea of, of why those trends might have happened, and um, again, need to look at that in a bit more detail when we're speaking to stakeholders. Getting on to that bit now. The second step has been um, to think about, the, in particular, there's a new suite of Welsh legislation that I'm going to introduce to you a little bit because it is very new and I, I didn't know about it when I moved to Cardiff six months ago, so it's worth kind of giving people a bit of an overview. Okay. Um, so the first piece is the, future gen the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. This in particular is being kind of lauded as this really innovative new piece of legislation um, I was at meetings recently where it was said that Wales is the um, could be a kind of seen as a global leader, seeing this new, innovative, in, kind of very integrated approach to dealing with social, economic, environmental, and cultural challenges. There are seven, seven wellbeing goals. We don't know what the indicators for wellbeing are going to be yet. We're still trying to work that out. So it's great, but we don't know what's happening yet and how what it's going to look like in practice. Um, there's the Environment Wales Bill, which was um, brought into play this year or last year. Um, and again, it's taking a more integrated approach to sustainability, very much linked to the sustainable development goals, and taking an area-based approach to, um, to management. So NRW, for example, have been trying to develop um, area-based um, statements to get an idea of the state of our natural environments in Wales. To a lesser extent, we've got three other new pieces of legislation. The Planning Act, which again is very linked to sustainability, and in particular, those three pieces of legislation are very linked together. There's a lot of um, overlaps and connections between really the well-being idea and the fact that we're trying to preserve our, ha our habitats and our environments for the future generations. So yeah, it's strategic development, it's sustainability, um, planning and licensing, it's all developed, linked to those sustainable development goals. And then very much to a lesser extent, and I'm not gonna talk about these very much, but there's the Active Travel Wales um, Act and also the Historic Environment Wales Act. And with the Active Travel, it's important because for salt marshes, you'll have cycling routes, walking routes potentially, you've got coastal access issues, but also you have um, railway lines that go quite close to some of our salt marshes. Um, from a historic environment, it's more about those cultural ecosystem services that we wanted to think about. So this is my search term base, which kind of was developed, and you can't see it, but it was developed from um, a UK NEA based um, ecosystem <coughs> services framework for salt marshes. So it was a it's a list of all the various ecosystem services, ecosystem processes, and ecosystem benefits that could be mentioned in governance instruments. So it's a really, really long list. I'm just starting to look at this. I've only been in post six months, so it's all very new still. Um, so the initial observations, what I did was actually use Envivo to do a, a term search in these documents to try and identify what, how often these um, terms were being recognised in um, the governance instruments. Um, and so really it's a, it's a frequency, it's a count um, indicator, <coughs> and it's worth pointing out that it kind of comes with a bit of a health risk. <coughs> That what it doesn't do, that the way you would normally see with Boolean searches, where it, it can, it would um, 
you know, it would take something like carbon sequestration if you had it in inverted commas and it would recognise the phrase. And Vivo doesn't really do that. It tends to pull out both words. So although I've got 212 here, I need to go back and actually look at the context and look at where, you know, what's being mentioned, how it's being mentioned, and what the context of that consideration of the ecosystem services is. The third step then has been to actually think about, right, we know what we have, but how is it being used? So we need to talk to the stakeholders and practitioners that are actually using those governance instruments. What's most important? So since September, I've been doing interviews with relevant stakeholders in my three case study sites. So it's included things like NFU Cymru, um, the national parks, um, my case, case study sites are within a special area of conservation, so it's within the site manager there, um, various councils, some of the consultants that have been involved in the shoreline management plans. To get an idea of what's important, so some of these are the, the key questions I've been asking. So one of the things I wanted to look at was how aware are people of the new legislation and what are the implications of that in terms of the challenges and opportunities associated with that. And believe me, Brexit came up loads. Um, how engaged people have been with policy change? So, you know, do people actually feel like they're getting given the support to actually embed these new changes, and particularly for the um, Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, because there's that new concept of well-being. There's definitely a bit of a we don't know what to do. We're in a time of cuts of res, you know res, resource reductions for local councils and local authorities for NRW. How are we going to deliver these new responsibilities with reduced resources? And that's definitely been a challenge. Um, but for the, for this for the end of this presentation, I wanted to think about yeah, I'm fine. fine. Um, I wanted to think about the salt marsh ecosystem services and benefits that were identified. And thankfully, my stakeholders did identify the ones I would expect them to see. So I mapped it onto my framework. I did try and put it on the slide, but it was far too tiny, and especially in here, you would never have seen it. Um, but I mapped the ones that were identified by the stakeholders, by the interviewees onto the framework that we'd used um, to kind of find those search terms. And they were mentioning what we expected them to see. So it didn't really give me any way. It was supposed to give me a way of focusing on one group of ecosystem services, and it didn't allow me to do that because it was very evenly spread. Um, but also thinking about how we're going to move on to value, sorry, value ecosystem services, because that's my job for next year, is to start thinking about how we value ecosystem services. And we've talked a lot today about the different ways you can value ecosystem services. And part of these interviews was to say, What's going to be most useful for you guys? We want to make sure this project is applicable to policymakers. So one of the questions I was asking was, you know, how do you value? How would you value the, the ecosystem services associated with salt marshes? And really, there's a lot of concern around the difficulties attributing value, concerns around only attributing economic value, and whether that means it's too easy to make trade-offs associated with econ economics from a policy perspective. So does it mean that just because something is financially more valuable, it's actually more valuable? Um, and does it mean you shouldn't protect it or manage it in the same way? But that actually, it's really important in terms of trying to engage the public with the ecosystem services supported by these kind of coastal fringe habitats. They are used by agricultural and by, <coughs> by farmers. You know, they are a very important um, environment within Wales and obviously in other areas. So it's important in terms of being a tool or communication messaging, um, but how do we do it? Um, there's very much an awareness of the different types of value, but we need to, have, I need to have a better understanding of, of, of what's going to be most useful for policymakers. Um, and I'm going to finish up now really quickly. So the next steps, which you guys can't see, so I'll read through them, is to um, assess the governance and policy effectiveness. Last slide. Policy effectiveness. So how effective are these pieces of governance actually? Like what's, how effective are they in terms of implementation? actually designing a protocol for assessing the ecosystem services value, and there are a number of ways we can do that. <coughs> Comparing practitioner and community values, um, investigating the relationship between the value and how that's recognised in governance, um, and looking at future scenario workshops and modelling to think about how how we kind of how we consider that and take that into consideration as things continue to change with climate change and moving through the future. Sorry, done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma. But I think we are going to have that's no problem. To, um, <laughs> for later, if people want to hang around. Um, so we have Connor Owens up next, and just as soon as the computer's doing what I ask it to. Thank you very much. Off to Ireland. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, I should uh, prefix this by I have a bit of a neck injury at the moment, so I'm sorry if I'm just pivoting around at this spot a bit strangely. <laughs> it was unrelated to this field work by school safety officer, it'd be quick to point out. Uh, so don't, <laughs> let it, don't let it happen after this, so don't let it bias uh, you against the... Good, I will about. 
Okay, um, so moving on, when, you're, when you say you're a field ecologist working in Ireland, this is frequently the kind of habitat that you often think that you're working in, and maybe some people are lucky enough to work here. Uh, however, in a lot of other cases, whenever land is used for any sort of utility, habitat conservation and uh, habitat for or utility are frequently uh, at odds. And that's the case for much of the landscape. And then even in some cases where land is used for any sort of discernible utility, you often get this, it's a mown down to a nice barren neatness. Um, so I'll come clean, this is a stock photo, uh, but this isn't, and that's probably the most untidy lawn I've seen in two summers of fieldwork. Um, okay, so that's a bit of a grim and heavy start, so to cheer you up, we'll talk about toilets. Um, so, or more specifically, dealing with wastewater effluent in the rural landscape. So Ireland has a rather large rural population, 1.4 million people, that's 37%. That equates to about 500,000 dwellings dealing with their wastewater on site, with 87% of that are septic tanks. So that's this blue area. Oh, there we are. Um, so the EPA released a report on this earlier in the year, and probably the most startling figure in that is about 39% of the country is unsuited to that style of traditional septic tank and percolation area. Um, well that sounds absolutely crazy, but then is it really that crazy? Because drinking water notices and eutrophication and all that sort of fun stuff is not terribly unusual, it's quite common. Um, and so one of the technologies in recent years to try and address this issue is the advent of constructed wetlands. So essentially it's a sealed system filled with some kind of soil and gravel matrix and planted with some kind of necessarily rugged species. So Phragmites and Typha would be quite uh, popular. And essentially what we're relying on is the physical, uh, chemical and biological properties of the system to emulate uh, natural wetlands. So physically, wastewater moves through the system slightly slower, large particles get caught in the matrix. Uh, chemically, things like phosphorus combined with um, calcium and aluminium in the soils and co-precipitate together. And biologically, we're simply exposing the wastewater long enough to natural soil uh, processes uh, both anaerobic and aerobic. Okay, but in a lot of cases, whenever there's a high water table or the soil is poorly porous, uh, a problem remains on where the water goes afterwards. So this is quite a large problem because it's often these areas that require one of these systems in the first place. So then a subtype of constructed wetland, which we started to look at, is uh, the willow bed. So essentially this is a seal basin, much like any other type, and we're simply just relying on the natural um, You've got a uh, transpiration ability of the willows during their summer growth window to regulate water levels and virtually eliminate any discharge. Um, so during the winter growth or during the winter dormancy period, they fill up, and then during the summer, uh, during the summer growth period, the water level goes down again with this rather amusing peak in the festive period every year uh, during periods of high traffic. Um, <laughs> so we have to mention willows, the hero of the hour. Why are they so suited to phytoremediation? Um, so they have a high transpiration rate during that summer window, as we said. Um, they're good for nutrient uptake. Um, it's, it's very small in comparison to the actual work that the soil does, but every little helps. Um, they facilitate denitrification of the root zone. They've got shallow root systems. They continue to work even when the sites are filling up. Uh, they're very resilient to pollutants. That's obviously quite important. And they're very easy to propagate, so I'll come back to that. So constructed wetlands in general, they're not a new technology. Um, they're relatively common. This is from Babatunde 2008. There was about 200 sites present at that time. Um, Constructed uh, willow beds, by contrast, are still very much in the pilot phase and tend to be concentrated in areas of low soil porosity, such as in Wexford here in the southeast. Um, so you might say, why now? Why are these kind of sites kind of popping up all over the place uh, relatively quickly? Well, up until relatively recently, you could build your house pretty much anywhere you wanted, and that was fine. Um, uh, happy days. <laughs> uh, until you have, if you have if you're in an unsuitable area with poor soil porosity um, and a traditional system, then you can have problems. And maybe that's not the point. But then people being people kind of just get on with it until there's some kind of financial incentive to actually change. Now that this is quite rigorously legislated, um, people often add one of these willow systems onto their house um, to deal with this problem. Um, and then at the extreme end of the spectrum, you won't get planning permission in the first place if you, if you don't have one of these systems currently. Okay, so just it's all very well talking about it, just to give you an idea of the scale. They're quite big, they're quite expensive. Um, here's the impermeable liner going in. Um, it's quite expensive because you want to make sure it's good quality and you don't have to dig it up and repair it at any stage. Um, here's the percolation area going in. And of course, uh, the management regime of these sites is relatively uh, minimal. So one only needs to coppice one third of the site. Uh, so basically you only need to interact with the site once a year and um, you can actually burn this for fuel. So it's an extra benefit. Um, or in this case, we put the willow on the van, we cut it up and we use it to plant another site. So it's absolutely fantastic. And as long as you put them in the right way around, they'll pretty much do quite well. So, that's, um, <laughs> so just to remind ourselves of the stakeholders of this, we want to conserve biodiversity in the landscape. We also want to deal with domestic effluent in that same landscape. So we're kind of awkwardly caught in the middle trying to keep everybody happy. Um, so we want to know what's in the site in terms of biodiversity. And we do that by a biodiversity assessment. 
Uh, so I'm looking at both plant and invertebrates. Um, keeping it quite simple with Thera, so plants, random stratified sampling, um, just looking at species richness, various types of diversity, classifying, classifying according to growth form, um, grime life strategy. Then for invertebrates, uh, we've got sticky traps of various heights, both low down for the herb component and high for the canopy component, and at various locations of the site, um, and at various times throughout the season. So early summer period, midsummer, and late summer. We've done that for two years. Um, and yeah, again, quite simple question. So what are the principles of bio, or what are the principal drivers of this biodiversity? So the sites are very different. Why is that? What's driving that? Um, are plants and invertebrate richness and diversity related? Um, do the sites make a meaningful contribution to the agri landscape? Um, does the surrounding land uh, around the sites influence that? And how does it compare to common uh, other common willow analogues, such as uh, shore rotation coppice or indeed natural willow woodland? Okay, um, so the, one of the great things about working with engineers is they've been looking at these sites for about seven or eight years. So we've quite detailed information um, in terms of evapotranspiration and water levels, meteorology, that kind of thing. Uh, in addition, we know the age of the sites, what variety of willows they've used, um, the effluent category going in. And while I've been recording biodiversity, I've also tried to get as many environmental variables as I can think of simultaneously. We've also been lucky enough to have a student working with us who's looked at the soil and nutrient profiles to try to see how the vegetation and soil changes in a gradient across the site from the wastewater input. Okay, um, so how are we getting on? Excuse me, so plant surveys completed, invertebrate surveys completed, um, IDing invertebrates is a bit of a tall order for a botanist. I always wanted to be an entomologist when I was a kid, so be careful what you wish for. Um, so that's currently <laughs> going on. And they are, they are quite variable, so I apologise for this rather clunky diagram. Um, but if you just, this is a, a grass dominated site, a low woody dominated site, or rubus, and a juncus or rush dominated site. So just some pictures of that. Here's our invertebrate trap and in a grass dominated site. Uh, a juncus, slightly wetter dominated site, and here's the low woody site. Um, so I've certainly lost a good few jackets to the rambles, but there are solutions to deal with that. Um, so here's a very intense diagram of our willow bed in the surrounding landscape. So it's very preliminary data, but already while the within patch diversity isn't particularly striking, if you consider the adjacent land use type and the barren lawn with which they uniformly set, um, they can make a substantial contribution. They're almost like islands in the landscape. Um, and just to compare it with the common analog, here's some willow SRC, done by Roe et al. in 2011. So um, the circles here are the willow, and the triangles are the set aside. So our sites are actually surprisingly high in comparison to that. So maybe not what you would expect from a nutrient enriched habitat, um, but the variation is quite high. So we're looking to integrate the data from this summer, to see if the patterns we're observing are true. And it's perhaps not a strictly legitimate comparison. Our sites are quite small, so quite a high proportion of edge. So that edge component is probably pushing richness up a little bit artificially high. Um, so again, we're interested in what's in the site, how the surrounding landscape influences that, the contribution it can make to the landscape in terms of biodiversity at a local and regional scale. And the whole time we're out there, we're thinking management. So I'm not sure if you caught Nicholas Berkeley's talk on Miss Ganthus and Willow SRC earlier in the week, but um, as he said, the management prescriptions for these are often quite vague. Uh, so they're generally limited to don't slap one of these sites in an area which is already quite rich. So uh, we're hoping to do a little bit better than that because the species we're looking at are generally involved in quite pivotal roles in the landscape. So hemetra, hymenoptera, um, all of that sort of thing. So they generally tend to be pollinators, predators, and indeed pests. So we'd, look, we'd be looking to get more of a handle on that. Um, okay, so just bring it all together one last time. So we have our willow system introduced into which, which is sealed into which we're producing our, uh, introducing our domestic effluent. We're relying on a variety of processes to deal with that for us. Uh, we're interested in what's in the site itself, why it's there. And we're interested in what's driving the variation between sites, both internally and in the surrounding landscape. Uh, we're interested on how the surrounding landscape influences that. And we're also interested in how that biodiversity can contribute to the surrounding landscape. OK, so all I want to do is thank my awesome supervisors, Lawrence Gill, our uh, engineer collaborator, and Trinity for the money. And thank you for your time. Cheers. That was really efficient. So, um, there's lots of time for questions. Cool. Yeah, so, uh, so considering that the nutrient cycling is so important in these places, has anybody done any work on the soil form and flora? Um, that would be the next level. Um, we, I was, we traditionally looked at the, or the, the work that we have done has been on the plants and the invertebrates. So we did get an MSc uh, in to look at the soil, but that's primarily on the chemical cycling. So that would definitely be the next stage. If I had time, I would definitely love to go back. Maybe that would be further work to do on it. It's obviously quite integral to what's going on. So, but I, I think there's 
certainly an awful lot of interesting questions and work to be done in that area. Yeah. Is there an end lifespan for how long these systems can, can work and last? And what kind of management do you need to do to maintain them? That's, that's a really good question. So because the, the, these particular systems are relatively novel, so we've been monitoring for about seven or eight years, but looking at other very similar systems, um, they, you seem to be able to expect something like 20 years. Uh, one could expect. We, we don't really know. We don't really know until there's a problem. Uh, hopefully they'll be doing quite well. Um, I think there was, <coughs> there was another talk I can't remember earlier in the week of a guy using very similar systems for mine tails in Canada, and he, he had a system which is in the, the late 20s, I think. But I think it will depend on what you're using the system for, but hopefully the very limited management regime that you need will still make it financially viable over maybe a 20 year expected lifespan. Uh, what, uh, what time of year are you doing your Convertible service. Well, I imagine for Willow Cloud is quite early, so I've got lots of protection. So, we, we, have, we have a, a late spring sampling in April, then we have a mid summer, which would be about the end of June, and then we have an end of August sampling. So we're trying to get, I mean, it's, it's a snapshot, but we try to get the widest possible snapshot. Just, you mentioned the um, flowering early. Uh, the interesting thing there is, whatever management regime is deemed to be um, uh, uh, useful for this. Uh, even if we affect the, the herb layer, that willow canopy will always be there and we won't interfere with that. So no matter what happens, you'll still have that pollinator resource early in the in spring. Did you find a difference in how, how many, what the effect of the willow is having, depending on what time of year you're looking, is having more of an effect in the early season? Uh, which, which kind of effect? Uh, just increased pollinator abundance or reduction abundance? Um, that, that, that's currently what, currently what we're looking at, I'm looking at that at the moment. What level of identification are you looking to do with your sticky cups? Uh, another, another very good question. So I mean, a lot of people have called it an order, and I, I was, I'd probably be relatively happy to that, but kind of I, I really want to make a, a better job of it. So we're trying to go to family. That is currently the plan. So I give myself a, a two-month window to do that. Um, and then, uh, depending on how it goes, I might need to randomly subsample. The, idea, the, the hope is to go to family. Any other questions? single house so the, the sites will vary in size based on you know how many people are there living in that site so they're calibrated for maybe a family of five four three and then there there are some sites which have multiple houses feeding into the one site so those systems will be big and um, for the willow sites that's pretty much as big as they get but i mean there there are constructed wetlands like reed beds which serves entire towns of populations of 1000 2000 but as you'd expect those ones are absolutely gigantic they're very big they're, they're tailor-made for what they are would be used for. Um, between ten, maybe ten by twenty meters, and um, ten by thirty meters. It depends on other variables such as what kind of soil they have. Um, I think that. Okay. If there's nothing else, I say thank you very much. Thank and you. Move on. Okay. So last speaker for the day. Lucky. Mm -hmm. Lucky spot. Um, Is that way around? Yes, I think so. Um, there we go. If we can, um, welcome Felicity Shelley. And thank you all for staying around. Hey, yeah, thanks for all being here. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of my postdoc work. Um, my background's more in methane cycling um, in rivers, um, but throughout my postdoc, I've applied a lot of the stable isotope trace techniques from that work. Um, into some measurements of nitrogen cycling. And I'm specifically going to talk about the effectiveness of large wood debris, which is often used as a restoration um, tool for other reasons, um, and potentially alleviating nitrate pollution in rivers. Um, oh, I forgot to say that this is in collaboration with University of Birmingham and um, Imperial College. <coughs> so some of you might not be very familiar with nitrate or the nitrogen cycle, so I'll just run through some basics for you. So nitrate is um, a naturally, completely naturally occurring form of fixed nitrogen. By fixed, I mean it's available to organisms to uptake. Um, the main other form that you'll have heard of is <coughs> ammonium. Um, so many ecosystems are nitrogen limited, um, but we have cleverly invented industrial nitrogen fixation, which you'll probably know as fertilizer production or the Harper-Bosch process. 
um, so that we can farm more intensively. Um, and it's quite widely accepted that we couldn't possibly feed ourselves if we didn't have fertilisers. However, um, we have quite catastrophically um, perturbed the nitrogen cycle. And this nice schematic from Canfield et al. in this science paper um, puts some numbers on the whole situation and he reckons that we've more than, more than doubled the amount of fixed nitrogen that would naturally be going into the terrestrial um, biome area. Um, so I know there's a lot of concern around CO2 and a lot of the climate change and carbon talks talk about what we've done to the CO2 levels, but what we've done to the nitrogen cycle is much more crazy and receives much less attention. So because um, nitrogen uptake on farmland is particularly inefficient, um, meaning a lot of the nitrogen doesn't actually get taken up by the crops, it either gets denitrified in the soil to nitrogen gas or washed um, into groundwaters or streams, um, we've seen catastrophic ecological consequences, um, especially when that ni excess, nitrogen get excess nitrogen gets delivered to places via streams to um, either parts of rivers or estuaries and coasts where nitrogen is limiting. So some examples of that are algal blooms, fish kills, um, and enhanced greenhouse gas emissions associated with lower oxygen. So despite um, a whole swathe um, or raft of um, leg legislation to reduce nitrogen reaching streams, um, concentrations, especially in the UK, are still increasing. Um, and one key point to note um, is that, especially in groundwater fed streams, even if we stopped applying fertilizer tomorrow, it would still probably increase for several decades to come because of the, the time lag um, of how long it takes groundwater to come back into streams. So how can we decrease excess nitrogen once it's in the river? That's what we're looking at. Um, so one point to note is that most fertilizer is applied in the form of ammonium. Um, but when ammonium is exposed to oxygen, it will readily be converted as part of the nitrogen cycle um, to nitrate. So I'm going to primarily focus on nitrate here. Um, there are three ways that nitrate can be removed. Um, most people know about denitrification. There are actually two other ways, anamox and DNRA, um, which are quite under-researched and generally assumed to be quite insignificant in fresh waters. Um, but recent um, work in our group shows that all three of them are active. So I use a technique which is able to um, measure all of them. Um, the key um, distinction between the, um, two, the three of them is that two of them completely remove nitrogen from the biosphere. So denitrification and anamox produce N2 gas, um, which is we're quite happy living with lots of N2 gas, there's 80% of it in the atmosphere. So in terms of this issue of excess nitrate in rivers, we quite like that option, um, but DNRA actually converts it into ammonium, which is then stored and potentially eventually goes back to nitrate, so it's not really retaining the river. And it's important to note that um, less sophisticated techniques, which just, just measure um, bulk change in nitrate concentration in rivers um, over an area, will not actually, they might claim to have measured nitrate removal, but they're probably also um, seeing some nitrate which has just been stored in the system. So with our use of isotopes, we're able to distinguish between the three. Um, all three processes require low oxygen, not necessarily hypoxia, but low oxygen, and um, they need nitrate, that's the food, and an orga organic carbon source. So this is a very simplified situation as I see it. Um, we have the surface water, very nitrogen rich, um, nitrate rich, especially in the UK, especially in lowland rivers in the UK. Um, and in the surface water, we've got plenty of oxygen relative to the bed um, and relatively low organic carbon. Whereas in the riverbed, we have low oxygen, high organic carbon. So in the riverbed, there's lots of potential to denitrify and chomp through the nitrate and deal with this situation. But we need to get the surface water into the riverbed to maximise this. And I should say that most riverbeds will be performing denitrification but here we're just looking about how we can enhance that natural process to help deal with our pollution problem. So when the bed's very flat and boring, um, we don't expect very much um, exchange between surface water and the riverbed. Um, and when surface water with lots of nitrogen does enter the bed, it's likely to be quite short residence times and therefore a um, limited chance of staying in there long enough to undergo denitrification. 
Whereas if we put some sort of structure, such as large woody debris in the river, we increase the heterogeneity, um, hopefully create a bit more turbulent flow, enhance the chances of surface water with all that nitrate going into the bed um, and undergoing some form of nitrate removal. We also hoped or hypothesized um, that the residence times in the bed would be longer if there's all these kind of structures and turbulent flow conditions. So we've, we've hypothesized that by putting in um, large woody debris or in rivers where there is large woody debris, we would see enhanced um, nitrate removal capacity in that riverbed. So I'm going to talk you through two um, studies that I've worked on. First one is the main part of my um, postdoc in collaboration with um, Stefan Kraus at the University of Birmingham. Um, and the study site was actually on the grounds of a Buddhist monastery in a very nice forest in South Downs National Park, just on the Hampshire West Sussex border. Um, as you can see in by the zoomed in OS map, the catchment is mainly wooded, um, but further up um, there's um, some arable and pastoral farming. So here's a panoramic um, a panorama of the, um, the site. Um, it's about 70 metres long. It's a very, very intensive um, study with loads of different overlapping groups looking at all sorts of um, um, techniques. Um, and there are three main large woody, natural woody structures in this stream. Um, this picture was actually taken at quite high flow. But if you notice, there's a really big log across here. Um, <coughs> and this is that zoomed in. Um, so as you can see, the sand's building up behind the log and then there's a bit of a kind of plunge pool afterwards, and we're all, as always falling in a hole just down the, down the downstream of that. Um, and here's another one of the structures at the downstream end. Um, again, there's a big sandbar here, and it collapsed actually a few months into our work. We studied it for a whole year. Um, this sandy stream was really, like, the sands was shifting continually every season. We um, different, um, we noticed changes, and actually we measured, um, we put in these, um, these, we call them flexible piezometer bundles. They're basically a large central tube um, installed to a set depth, and it has five smaller tubes around the outside that we use for water sampling, which are terminated at different depths. So we end up with um, a 10, 20, 30, 50, and one meter depth, and so which we can get data, um, we can get pore water from. Um, so it ended up with about 800 pore water chemistry data points and about 300 um, actual process measures. And I used a push-pull technique with um, 15 labelled nitrate, which is very complicated, but I can talk to you about it later if we have time. Um, so here are my results, or a subset of my results. Here I've picked out oxygen, nitrate, ammonium, and phosphate. Um, and as you can see, the strong chemical gradients in the top 30 centimetres of the pore water. These at minus 20 on the surface water, just to give you an indication. So we see that something is rapidly consuming oxygen and nitrate in the top 30 centimetres on the two left graphs. Um, at the same time, ammonium and phosphate are being able to accumulate. So we looked at this data and hypothesised that most of the activity is going on in the top 30 centimetres. And sure enough, when we looked at the process um, measurements, this depth on the y-axis there, um, the bulk of the activity is in the top 30 centimetres. So there's a huge range in the top 30 centimetres. So why is that, and is it something to do with wood? Oh, and we were able to split the three processes, and we did have all three processes, and we, I think we were the first to measure all three processes simultaneously in a riverbed. So what described um, the variation we see in nitrate attenuation? Um, this graph on the left is ambient nitrate, so as we can see, there's an inverse um, non-linear relationship there. So we, where there's not much nitrate, there's a really high potential to consume it, so that makes sense. It means that it kind of, it's all eaten, <laughs> it's all consumed. Um, and then I coloured in um, the dots where nitrate was um, over 20 micromolar in black, and then put it on the other graph to see, look at chloride decay, which is a kind of a proxy for advective flow and connection to the surface water. So we can see that where there's lots of nitrate that's not been consumed, there's also quite um, fast um, residence times that should, um, yeah, short residence times and fast flow. So I hypothesise that this is because the um, connection with the surface water is too fast, so there's too much oxygen, and it turns off this potential to denitrify. So I've mapped this on top of the um, actual kind of well, map, the bathymetry of the site and the three largest woody structures. Um, as you can see, the largest or the highest activities to um, remove nitrate are around the woody structures. 
what you probably can't see are some also some really, really tiny dots um, in the same places. So it seems to be an all or nothing situation. And if we drill down into that, we can see that, yeah, there's a really big um, range of um, rates of denitrification ability um, by the wood, like within a metre of the wood. Um, but we also see that there's um, most nitrate by the wood, which doesn't make sense given what I've just said. And we can explain that by looking at this graph. Here I've colour coded um, points which are within a metre of the wood in brown and points which are more than a metre away from the wood in yellow, so you can call them kind of sandy controls. And you can see that the most extreme um, cases are all next to the wood. So it does seem that there's more surface water being delivered to the riverbed around the wood. Um, and that um, when it becomes too extreme and um, there's too much surface water connection, it kind of turns off the process. So very quickly, um, I'll just tell you about um, a project which I've jumped on the back of with Joe Huddart and Guy Woodward in the Stour, where they experimentally manipulated a huge um, chalk stream and the landowner very kindly allowed them to um, set up an ideal experiment and add in loads of wood. So they felled the riparian um, trees, pinned them in place, and here's some of the restorations. Um, and then just before I did this, and then a year after they did this, I measured everything that I could measure in terms of surface water and pore water chemistry and the um, potential to denitrify. Um, I found that after, wasn't hugely convincing, but afterwards there was generally hot spots of um, more nitrate attenuation around the wood. Um, but um, really I noticed there's lots of fine sediment superficially um, kind of deposited just immediately around the wood and then the rest of the bed wasn't really affected. So then I took this fine sediment to in the lab and measured every carbon and nitrogen cycling process that we're capable of doing and also the sediment characteristics and found out that by the wood, this very fine sediment had obviously a much um, smaller grain size but also had way more organic carbon and nitrogen had a slightly different C to N ratio, which implies there's more um, like breakdown of organic matter around the wood. Um, and overall, um, there's uh, 14 times um, more potential for nitrate removal, and tw but 26 times um, increase in CO2 and methane emissions, which was not something we really considered. So to summarize, um, nitrate removal um, we think is enhanced around the wood, but if the retention time is long enough to allow that, um, that nitrate to um, go into anoxic conditions or hypoxic conditions. Um, but restoration planners should take note of these results and they need to trade off the fact that yes, they might be dealing with some of the nitrate problem, but they're probably also producing hotspots of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and finally, um, particularly with that Stour um, experiment where we were allowed to put in wood, we had a lot of problems with the Environment Agency who kept making our restoration smaller and smaller and smaller because they were worried about flood risk. Um, and we've seen no change in the surface water concentration whatsoever. And we think to actually change the deal with the surface water problem, um, we need to be a lot braver with the size of the restorations. That is it. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, so not really a question, more of a, just a comment, but just wondering if you're aware there's been some research very recently published on um, beavers down in uh, Devon that have been there in an enclosed area and they've, they've got sort of in-stream measurements above and below the, the beaver sign and it reported like significantly lower <coughs> levels of nitrate and phosphorus and sediment coming out of the, okay. the site as well as all the effects on biodiversity and everything else. I was just yeah. looking at the, uh, the water. I saw something about beavers yesterday and I was wondering about that. Yeah, but obviously that's really people. If it was near a town like the Stour yeah, between Ashford and Canterbury, there's no way to let them dam up a whole river. Yeah, but I think that is the best way to remove nitrate. It's still yeah. I mean, obviously they're very yeah. It's all very very new all that stuff. But it seems like they obviously specialise in putting woody debris in uh, in streams and, and stuff. So they yeah. can play a free role at that. Like, yeah, sort of processing nitrate. Yeah, I mean, naturally, wood would have just been allowed to fall into streams, but because of flood risk and it doesn't look very nice, we've land managers have taken it out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we might um, thank all of the speakers now, but if you have any more questions, I'm sure if you, um, they'd be happy to hang around and ask them that we'll release this into the coffee. So thank you very much for everybody who spoke today. It's been a really interesting session. <laughs>
No, it's just become quite a lot because it's focused on information systems and it's looked at their cultural and social um, context. So he's done a um, sort of stru- uh, questionnaire analysis, basically textual analysis, where I think he sort of works with highlighting it. So it looks at the words that map onto each aspect. Yeah, exactly. So I, I actually didn't mention that I was going to be for those technical, I think it must have been very much for German scholars. Yeah, no, I like your talk as well. Um, yeah, well, it's good you touched on that. Yeah, it's, it's good. That it's been it's been some interesting yeah, research recently looking at the effects of which you touched on, which is some other sort of tended to be nearly touched on, but didn't that you mentioned it was like the effect of being in nature or mental health. You know, it's been there's been some. 